Camille and Ian have lost their sexual chemistry. Angie, we know exactly why you so confident, boo. And Ty, I don't know if this couple life is for you. What's good, y'all? It's your good sis, Erica Vane, coming to you right here on Erica Vane TV with another Harlem video. In this video, we are breaking down season two, episode number three, which was utterly hilarious with beautiful messaging if you're new here hit that subscribe button and turn on your bell notification so you don't miss out on any of my harlem videos because we having all the harlem conversations baby and they are good and without further ado let's go ahead and jump on into this discussion so i want to actually start this video off talking about angie because in this episode we got more insight into her as a character by way of her family she goes back home to staten island to visit for the day and kick it with her four brothers her mother her daddy she come from a two-parent household looks like they're full of love upper middle class it's giving and it's nothing like what some people would expect i think especially given some of the criticisms that i have seen pop up with the release of this new season specifically for the angie character we know our girl is loud bold brazen um a little sexually promiscuous but not like in a negative way just like calling a thing a thing and i have been seeing a lot of conversation online of people having a problem with it however in watching her mom and listening to her mom pour into her as she is communicating self-doubt communicating um feelings of lack and, and negative self-talk as well as her brother like checking in with her after they have a little bit of a powwow and again reaffirming how amazing she is reaffirming that this is a marathon not a sprint i completely like 120 percent now more than ever understand how Angie got to a place where she is so aspect of her life that she's talking about. Now we do see her stumble in reference to careers with confidence, right? So she does experience self-doubt and she has experienced imposter syndrome. But more often than not, we've also seen her have a little bit of an inflated ego and she's still battling like her high confidence in career. And the only thing that's like bringing her down is like the lack of results. I think it was so dope that she has this ingrained foundational confidence instilled in her by her family, which was most, which was mostly like supported and, and done by her mother. And she, you know, Sherry Shepard plays her mom. Hey, a loud, bold, brazen, confident woman herself. Um, she communicates like, girl, you were ahead of the pack. Like you were always told you were enough. You were always told that you were great. You were beautiful. You were this, you were that. And again, it just made so much sense and it hit home. And honestly, I had a moment while watching like, damn, I wonder what that would be like. Now, don't get me wrong. I love my mama. My mama is a real one. Hey mama, if you're listening and if you're watching, <laughs> but um, my mom comes from a place of um, having generational trauma, specifically with her mom. And then her mom has experienced not necessarily having the best or strongest mother figure. So generationally, I have experienced just like a little bit of lack in reference to reaffirming certain things in reference to confidence. So I've struggled um, in different ways. And the confidence that y'all might see from me now or hear from me now comes from me learning different things, being exposed to different things, and really really just like building up certain muscles, certain ideals, certain beliefs and reaffirming, reaffirming things for myself. And I'm looking at Angie in this episode and I'm like, damn, how much further along would I be if I had a completely resolute, super confident, don't back down, like not that my mom backed down or anything, but like a mom that was like, Angie's mom, as we see in this episode. And again, no shade to my mom because I love my mama. She's the perfect mama for me. And also, I love my journey. So, like, I just want to be clear. But I just thought it was really dope. And going back to some of the criticism that I have seen online um, since the season two premiere last week, some people are starting to, you know, say that the Angie character is a trope of, like, overly loud and promiscuous black, promiscuous black women. And they were struggling with the fact that she's a dark-skinned woman. And I'm like... One, I get tropes <laughs> and I understand how um, sometimes we struggle with the idea of that. But Angie as a character 
is not that. Even giving her the backstory that we see in this episode is so far left from what you could expect from what people would typically present for a dark skin um, plus size or I think she's regular size, but plus size woman within this role. And again, I think that it's brilliant that the layering that we get to understand exactly how Angie arrived at this confident place because I have been watching. I ain't even gonna hold you. I don't, I don't know if I realized it until I watched this episode, but I have been watching like, girl, how are you just so willing and able to do whatever the hell it is that you want to say whatever it is that you want to go after whatever man you want? Because even that, like I'm still at a place now when it comes to romance, like I'm not shooting my shots with no damn body. <laughs> <laughs> well actually that's a lot I might shoot my shots with like girlfriends like home girls and like girls I want to like be in community and tribe with but with a man I'm not gonna do it but Angie she is about that life she sees something she wanted she gonna go get it and it's because she has a certain thing ingrained in her that we learn in this episode of like anything that she could possibly like imagine or her heart's desire she deserves and she's gonna go after it and again i just think that this episode did a beautiful job of giving us context for what we see this also makes sense of like how she moves so effortlessly from setback to setback and even in this episode, we were able to see that we're watching her move effortlessly and kind of like pick up herself up and move on to the next. However, it is taking a toll on her. She is having certain thoughts mentally. However, her core, her confident core and foundation is really holding up strong and helping her push back. And then in this episode where her going to go see her family, it's like the little bit of the refill of the cup that she needs. And I just thought it was so dope and it was so timely. Again, I brought in conversations that I saw outside of this and I am going to make a separate video about the Angie character because again, I have been seeing a ton of criticism about her being promiscuous, being so forward, being so loud. And I think that we need to, as a group or as a culture, I yes, hold creatives accountable for stereotypes but also we got to be willing to allow certain things to exist because this angie is a woman that exists in the world we are not monolithic we have all been saying this screaming it from the rafters and for some people to like have an issue with how this character presents but not really be able to look at the nuances and the greatness that she's bringing to the table by way of this characterization within this specific group i think it's doing the show itself a disservice, but then also each other. I feel like watching Angie as a character, I am low-key giving myself permission to do different things in life. And that's like some of the best parts about art and media. Like when you can see yourself, when you can, you know, see different walks of life, see different experiences and say, hey, what about this for me too? And like, let me try it and then go for that sh in life. All right, I didn't mean for this to, talk, to turn into no TED Talk, but I wanted to start off there because Angie just brought all the positive vibes for me in this episode. She grounded the episode a lot in reference to messaging. I absolutely love the conversation that her mom had with her and her brother had with her, and I thought it was so dope, and I want to see more of that. Like, I really want to see more of that. Not to mention the conversations that was happening with Angie's family and her provided a great juxtaposition for what's happening on Quinn's side of things. So with Angie, who has a very supportive mother, who is 10 toes down, believes in her, has is reaffirming to her, Quinn experiences a mom who is constantly criticizing her, constantly telling her that she's two steps behind or she's not enough when Angie's always being told that she is enough. And even that in of itself, y'all, if you are a person who has an issue with the with the Angie character and like, why is the dark skinned woman promiscuous and bold and loud and confident? Da, 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 like this isn't given trope because also the light skinned girl, the lightest of the bunch, Quinn, is being told by her other lights like the other light skin the matriarch light skin that girl you're not enough that you need to do more like then what's wrong with you and when the hell is that ever the case light skin has always been giving preferred model uh ideal better and Quinn is being told at every turn, whether it's by her mom or certain life, like life circumstances and how things are playing out that she's not enough and she's struggling with that ideal. And I think that that is really dope for this show to be having that conversation specifically with the women of these different colors within our race. 
Now, I don't know if I said that as articulate as I would like to, but y'all get what I'm putting down and drop down in the comment section if you have any questions or if you want to add on to that point. Because I really want to have that conversation. I would love to dive more de deeply into that. Now, we get to meet Quinn's daddy, played by Rick Fox. Hey, Rick Fox. In this episode. And it's so dope to see that she does have somebody to support her, which is probably how we get the like development within Quinn of like the unsureness because her father is like reaffirming and supportive and great she can talk to her mom is very demeaning and dismissive and all of that so the little back and forth that we see the like flakiness that we see in Quinn I think that that's a, a combination of her parents and how she has had to interact with them and then basically a result of that i love that she does have her dad to be able to go to and i love the conflict and the path to resolution because it's not completely resolved but quinn confronting her mom in this episode was really dope what i struggle with though and what i have the biggest critique with uh, for quinn is that girl you dated isabella for literally two maybe three days y'all went on two dates you slept together once where she went down on you and you were too giggly or whatever to do it. Like, I am not convinced that Quinn is queer. And I don't know if I am not supposed to say that as a heterosexual woman, but I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that Quinn isn't just seeking out this whole or wasn't just seeking out this Isabella relationship because she wanted to be wanted and Isabella wanted her. I'm not convinced that Quinn isn't looking at queerness as some type of fetish, similar to how some white men can look at, you know, dating a black woman as exotic or black men can look at others as exotic. Like Quinn has really been giving me that. And to watch her discuss how deeply hurt and distraught she is behind this Isabella thing. I kind of get it, but then again, I don't. Like, I don't feel like it was that big of a thing or had lasted that long to be eliciting such a response. With her running around saying, Isabella broke up with me. Isabella broke up with me. Y'all were never really even together, girl. Y'all had two dates and sex. What are we talking about? You were more with Sean watching his kid and everything else than you were with Isabella. And we don't see you running around boohoo crying about your lack of interest all of a sudden for him. Like, I don't know. Y'all let me know in the comment section, am I missing something when it comes to Quinn and this Isabella relationship? Because the fact that she's just so distraught is beyond me. Now, what I will say and what I can validate because I can see is that she's not distraught about Isabella particularly. She's distraught about feeling never wanted, never being enough and losing hope that she will ever find love. And I feel like that's the real conversation that needs to be had. So for her to be throwing up hissy fits about how she can't talk to her mama about this and nobody understands that because of Isabella specifically, it's like, girl, let's get to the root of the problem because it's not the Isabella relationship or lack thereof that is the issue. Your neediness needs to be addressed. Your need of validation outside of yourself needs to be addressed. Like there's some deep self work that needs to be done. And like, I can't take it seriously if we're just going to use Isabella as the figurehead for your deep seated problems. Does that make sense y'all? And I mean, Harlem is really well written as a show. So that could wind up being the actual case. And this whole time she's masking it with the whole conversation around Isabella. And that could come out later. But I'm going to go ahead on the record now and say what I said. I'm not trying to be offensive. So if there's anyone in the queer community who is offended by me saying I don't believe that Quinn is queer, I would love for you to explain if I overstepped or if I'm wrong in the comment section or send me a DM or an email, my goal was not to offend at all. I am always going to be respectful of other people, their lived experience and their expression of self. Um, so I will apologize in advance if I offended anyone who's queer and is listening. Um, but I would like further clarity and I would like to understand. So feel free to explain that to me. I'm open eared. Now, moving on <laughs> to our new favorite couple, Camille and Ian, who start this episode out seemingly non-sexually compatible anymore. Now y'all done been around a block a little bit with, each, with different partners and now y'all can't seem to fit together. 
But y'all, come to find out by the end of the episode, they actually were both in their heads about it, which low-key builds up to the point of like, yo, Camille and Ian actually belong together because while it was seemingly like Camille is the one who was in her, in her head and Ian just kind of goes with the flow, we're just getting further confirmation that no, he being in his head as well. He pulling out tricks from two girls past. Meanwhile, Camille think that this is what he was doing with Mira and Mira so flexible and this and that and then he thinking that this is what Jameson was doing with old girl and she thinking about a damn porno that Ty had showed her from two years ago. It's utterly hilarious. I I really cracked up most in this episode watching Camille and Ian fumble about and I thought it was very refreshing to watch just like these two days in their lives of like trying to reacclimate with one another get to know each other again and restart their relationship it was really really interesting to watch but also like inspiring Watching them like not be connected, Camille actually goes to get <laughs> edibles because she gets advice from the girls. And Angie's like, girl, you could talk about sex or you can have sex. You can't do both. Come to find out she can definitely do both. Uh-huh. Uh-huh, Angie. It's not as easy for everybody else, girl. You could just go ahead and get it how you live, except for with the small penis man. And that's it. That's all. However, some people, you know, they in their heads. So as a plan to subvert actually talking about this with Ian after their first little run in, she decides to go get a bunch of edibles. They get hella high y'all. And then they do what high people do. They prophesy and like philosophize. And I know that's not a word, but it's so hilarious to me. And it came to mind about everything. And it's the most hilarious stuff I've seen on television. This whole, like in the, this whole year thus far, Yo, Ian and Camille are hilarious. Yo, Ian is in the mirror talking about he look like Drake and eyebrows. And then he gets all set. It's just, y'all have to watch it. If you haven't watched this episode and you watch my breakdown, why? Because I'm sitting here spoiling it for you. Um, but if you are, stop what you're doing and queue up Harlem and go and watch it on Amazon Prime. Because you will laugh. You will, Well, this episode, I didn't really cry. But you will feel a ton of things. And... Camille and Ian were leading the charge in the laughter as well as some of the sentiment in this episode. I really, really enjoyed their conversation by the end um, before they're able to actually have the good old sex that they was having before when she actually revealed where she was at. And they, you know, they level with each other about what their expectations were and how they were both in their heads. Um, I think Camille and Ian might be really great models for... Um, couples and relationships just talking things out and really being able to express themselves both this episode and last episode by the end of each episode they're just coming and having heart to hearts about where they are what they thought what they expected and then leveling with each other and meeting each other at a great place that both of them could settle and I just thought it was really really beautiful I really enjoyed this show y'all and I think you should too anyway so yeah, that's what's going on with Camille and Ian. Love them. And then last but certainly not least, Ty. Brandon comes back to move in with Ty. I don't know why. I'm really trying to think about that now. And I'm struggling aside from like one to 10 minutes over Ty and just continue to get on Ty's nerves. You know what? Actually, I'm lying. My first thought is that Brandon is coming back because he wants the attention that he came wanting to begin with. I think that he really just wants to know that he mattered to Ty and Ty can't seem to see that because she's so focused on her money and her lack of intimacy. And at the end of this, I'm, it's feeling like they're going to wind up getting to a good place. Hopefully, he'll take her for all the money that she got. And then they wind up just being friends towards the end. But it's definitely going to be a bumpy road leading up to that. Instead of sitting and having a conversation, Ty decides to go visit her, you know, dope lesbian friend couple that, you know, have been doing life together for years and have figured it out because she's basically going to go on the shadow or go see to see what that life will be like since she seemed to be struggling with it. And then she's also seemingly struggling with the observation and with the mundaneness that can be life. And it's interesting because by the end of the episode, she seemingly gets it like looking on at them sleep on the couch. Um, but she struggled throughout most of it, just feeling so bored. And I'm like, girl, you're, you're bored. Cause I'm not gonna say you're not bored, but you're also watching people at peace. And that's a blessing. Boredom in 2023 is a blessing. When is the last time that you've actually been bored? 
when is the last time that you've actually had room and space and time to actually feel boredom? I personally, in 2022, decided that I was going to start to chase boredom more because my life is so filled with ambition and thoughts and self-reflection and like trying to be a good friend trying to be a great daughter like all of the things that I don't feel like I have been bored since maybe middle school maybe high school at best but even then I was doing a hell of a lot and to watch her lesbian friend couple just do life make soup watch game shows the things that they actually like their life to to be full of to be at a slower pace i was looking at that like i know that's right that is giving beautiful and peace is definitely the prize and at first ty was missing it however by the end it looks like she got it however we're gonna have to see her execute it or put it into practice for herself for me to know that she actually picked up on the lesson because she was being a little bit bratty in my opinion and not catching what they was putting down all in all this was a really great episode for all of the girls we got really great insight into who they are as women and the things that matter most to them we're seeing certain shifts happen. Ty, Camille, we got background in reference to um Angie. And I don't know where we're at with Quinn because she didn't really come to a realization. She was able to confront her mom in a really good way and they were able to like settle it in the moment. I'm going to be looking at Quinn a little bit closer in episode four. And those are my thoughts. Let me know what you thought about the episode in the comment section down below. If you made it all the way to the end, Give this video a thumbs up and like it, y'all. I appreciate it once you do. I think you liked it because you watched the whole video. And if you watched the whole video and you ain't subscribed yet, honey, what is you waiting for? Click that subscribe button. I'm your good sis. You let it talk TV with. And I'm going to see you in my episode four breakdown of Harlem.